Welcome to today's episode of the Blueprint Podcast, where we throw out the old blueprint so we can become who we were always meant to to be. I'm your host, Jason Smith, and if you haven't already, make sure you click the subscribe button and share the podcast with your friends on social media and tag me in it at jbirdfit. Today I have a very special guest for you from TikTok, Chloe Talk. You guys are going to absolutely love Chloe. She's legit. She's amazing. Hey her guys. Con- her content <laughs> is freaking phenomenal. It's called Chloe Talk, everyone. Yes. C-L-O-E-T-A-L-K. I just... It's a new TikTok, so I just can't go live on it yet, but I'll put it in the comments right now. Everybody in the comment section, make sure you hype Chloe up and then go check her out at Chloe Talk, C-L-O-E-T-A-L-K. She's just under a thousand followers right now, but I think that's something we can handle tonight and get that taken care of for. Um, Amazing. So okay. everybody everybody on TikTok, this is Chloe. We're going to dive into the podcast here. I've got some questions for her. We will stop every now and again to answer your questions. Just understand this is all about relationships, personal development, and the things that we experience in our daily lives. So feel free to drop your questions in the chat. We'll get to them shortly. Yes. Well, Chloe, so here's the deal. First off, I'm Jason. I'm <laughs> Chloe. Nice to meet you. <laughs> we've never we've never met. We've actually never been formally introduced. We've yeah. been kind of messaging each other for a couple of days. And I first found Chloe a week ago on TikTok, you just popped up on my feed and your attitude and the way that you were engaging with the content. I like how you have it set up where you're kind of the camera's off to the side and it's like you're in a podcast style answering a question, but the answers that you give and the the way you present the information is just like so upbeat, it's positive, it's legit advice. Um, So how did you get started with all this and why did you choose to start doing it now? So if I'm being completely honest, um, I ended a two-year relationship around five months ago. And two years to me was a long time. That's the longest relationship I've ever been in. And after it ended, I kind of went through this like self-discovery phase where I was like dating and learning and trial and error. And I was going to therapy to like kind of understand myself and like what love is and, and what I'm kind of have to go through to find the right partner, which I still haven't found, but, um, but I'm still looking. And I guess it's just from trial and error. I started realizing, I wish somebody could tell me what I know now, but like six months ago or a year ago. So I was like, why not just share everything that I've experienced and what I've learned to people and see if they relate. And so far they have been. And so what does self-discovery look like for you? What are some of the things that you've been doing? So, so for example, I'm 25 years old. I'm a girl, obviously. So like as a girl, I'm very sensitive and uh, my ego gets hurt a lot. So a lot of the times if a guy doesn't want to go out with me or I date him for like a few weeks and then he breaks up with me, I think, oh my God, it's because I was ugly and too fat. Like automatically. That was like the thing that I would think of. That's horrible. Or I would think that they didn't, I wasn't good enough for them. And I was in this constant cycle and it caused me so much anxiety. And then I started going to therapy and started doing a lot of self-talk and self-learning And I was like, it's their problem. If they don't like me, it's their problem. And I also realized when I go out with a lot of guys and I'm the one who ends it, I realize it has nothing to do with them. I, they're just not for me. So why wouldn't it be the same when the guy ends it with me? Does that make sense? No, that makes total sense. So, so I started realizing this and then I started asking men like older men, their (laughs) advice and how they think when they break up with someone or how they think when they um, don't go for a girl. And it, it kind of put things into perspective and it has not, then I realized it has nothing to do with me. And so okay. what are some of the things that they've said that they're looking for from an older man's perspective? So some men will be like, I need a girl. Like I found a girl who was beautiful and smart and kind, good family, ambitious, but she was a little too loud for me. And then I'll find men who say the same thing, but I'll say that the girl was too quiet for them. And so then I realized it's just, what certain men have preferences on or a lot of the times men will say they're not ready like they found the perfect girl and they're just not ready so i was thinking okay so many guys that i've ended with maybe i was the perfect girl for them but they just weren't ready and so how old are these guys that you know aren't ready like 24 25 which that makes sense they're still in that building stage trying to figure things out and really they just don't know who they are quite yet so they're they're still very much in that place of like you self-discovery Exactly. Exactly. But then you take it personally. Like as a woman, you take it personally and you start to drive yourself insane. And you're like, why aren't they answering my text? Should I text him? Should I drive by his house? Like these things sound crazy, but every woman does it. If they're lying, if they say no, they're lying. 
Like every woman goes crazy. They can't think, they can't sleep, they can't eat. It's like constantly. And then you become one of those crazy women that men, that men make fun of. And it's like, you did this to me. <laughs> so <laughs> I slowly realize I don't need to be going crazy. Just, I just need to shift the way that I'm thinking and okay. look at what's realistic. Yeah. Nice. So have there been, aside from therapy, have there been any other influences, any books or maybe people that you followed that have inspired you to go a particular route or maybe you discovered something from them? Yes, actually. There's this girl on TikTok. Her name's like Coconut Milk Bob. And have you seen her videos? <laughs> no. <laughs> She's like millions of followers. And she was posting, this was around the time me and this guy ended. And she was posting like, oh, he's not texting you. It's because he's so in love with you that he is too speechless and can't think of what to text you, something like that. And she'll say things like that. And she like feeds into the delusion. And I realized it started giving me anxiety watching all of these videos. I'm like, no, no, this girl like is bad for me. I'm going to start believing every man is in love with me if they don't text me. Like I need to, I blocked her. And then I started, I started just doing like self-talk and like, asking, I guess, just the men around me in my life and talking to my therapist. And I started realize that, realizing that people who are delusional in that aspect, it creates more anxiety, which creates anxious attachment, obviously, um, and ruins their dating process. Like they're never going to find the right guy if you keep thinking like that. So now, now you're getting into my wheelhouse because I talk a lot about attachment styles. <laughs> I used to be anxiously attached. And so what are you now then? Well, I think now what I realize is that a partner, so since I'm like dating around, a partner is supposed to be there to add to your life and not take away from it. Mm -hmm. And I think being in a relationship where you're anxiously attached takes away joy from your life because when you're anxious and you're nervous about if they're going to reciprocate their feelings – you're kind of going backwards in your self-development. So they're taking something away. And so how did your anxious attachment show up in your relationship? What were some things that just drove you crazy and just pushed you towards that side of anxiousness? Because from my perspective, our attachment style is more like a spectrum. So we have all the attachments within us, but certain people can bring out certain elements of that attachment where some people make us more anxious, some can push us toward avoidance. And so we can go that ebb and flow. Things like texting. Are you somebody who expects a text at a certain time period, frequency of texting? So my past relationship that I was in for two years, the anxious attachment was not really about texting because it was a very serious relationship and it was very healthy and you know we loved each other and there was no doubt on our love for each other, the anxious attachment came more from if I was feeling anxious or down about myself, the only person that could cheer me up was him, which was bad because I need to cheer myself up. Um, but then after that, once I started like getting into the dating field, um, my anxious attachment came from if they texted me that day or if they had a certain tone on FaceTime, if they were more distant, I would have a bad day. Um, if I didn't hear from them, for one day straight, I would start thinking in my head, okay, he's ghosting me and I would lose my appetite. Um, and you know, people might hear this and think that that girl's crazy, but every girl goes through this. <laughs> I promise you because I'm very chill, but, um, but every girl goes through this. So it's like, and then I started realizing why am I driving myself crazy? Like I am in control of this. And, and then that's when I started, I guess, realizing anxious attachment is not it. So that's a horrible place to be because you end up giving your power away to that other person. Yeah. And so it can make you feel very powerless in the moment. And, you know, like you're out of integrity with who you really are as a person and your character yeah. because because you're giving so much to that other person that they, they can impact your mood, how you feel, um, the things that you're doing, your eating habits, your work habits, you know, everything just gets tossed into that. And so that can make us extremely anxious in that process as well. Yeah, exactly. It was, it's like, why does someone have so much power over me? I'm disrespecting myself by letting them have that much power over me. So what were some things that you did to gain your power back then moving forward away from the anxious attachment? I started going to the gym. Okay. And 
it, the serotonin it releases is so great for this because when you're in the gym and you're listening to music, it's kind of like you get in this zone where like they don't matter. The world is so much bigger and there's so much more important things than me worrying about this guy who's not texting me. Um, I started writing down a list of reasons why they're probably not the one. And then I thought to myself, okay, well, there's a reason this is happening. They're not the one. So, and if they were the one, they would be texting me and they would follow up and, and it would just work. Uh, but that's like a whole nother aspect on God and relationships that I believe in. Um, I started creating hobbies, for example, in this podcast. <laughs> it's great. It's a hobby for me. It's to be passionate about something. Because when I'm passionate about something, I put less importance on other things that aren't important. So that doesn't mean my family. I put so much importance on them because I know they're important. But then subconsciously, you know that that guy who's not texting you or that situation ship you're in, you subconsciously realize it's not as important. So you don't put so much focus on it. So it doesn't eat you alive. So like keeping busy with hobbies that make you passionate is very, very good for avoiding that anxiety that comes with relationships. So you allow yourself to get into situationships? Okay, I don't allow myself. I get out of them as soon as they're situationship -y. Um So and... what, what constitutes a situationship? What does that look like for you? I think someone you're dating for longer than a month where, there, where there's no label. So you go out a few times a week. Um, you guys get along. There's romantic interest involved. But after a month, you're still thinking, where are we? Or he hasn't asked you to be his girlfriend, or you're not 100% confident in his feelings for you. That's a situation ship. Do you follow Welcome to the Peasant Party at all? No, should I? <laughs> you should. Yes, I just did a podcast with her as well. And okay. this is like one of the hills that she's willing to die on is that when you start going on dates, plural, <laughs> right? So you've gone on one date, you are now scheduling the next date. You are dating because you have gone on multiple dates. Yeah. And so, and so we're very afraid to call that what it is in that we are in the process of dating. We're dating. And for a lot of people that scares them away or it makes them be a little standoffish or maybe they kind of move into a, a place of avoidance. And then we very quickly get ourselves into that situation ship because we're not willing to use the words of what's actually happening in the moment because we're afraid that we're going to end up being rejected by the person or scare them off in some way. Exactly. It's so true. And I think as I got older, if I go out with a guy like more than once or twice, I'll use scary words like, oh, I told my friend that I was dating you. Um, and I'll just slide that into a conversation to see how they react. And if they're like jarred by it, I'm out. Like, peace out. I'm done. And how how do they generally react? I don't think anybody is really going to be that no, jarred some, by it. <laughs> some guys. <laughs> they're like, who are whoa, around, hold up. <laughs> hold on. Some guys who are around my age are like, whoa we're dating now uh, like laugh like a loser and i'm just like ew okay i'm happy you revealed yourself now like peace out buddy i'm out of here no thanks nice yeah i like it i wish i knew all of this when i was 21 it would have saved me a lot of time and heartbreak that's for sure well i mean you're 25 so yes i know but <laughs> but i think I, that... I can assure you because i'm 45 are you really uh, very soon, yes. You have no wrinkles. I know. Isn't it great? You look very young. I thought you were like yeah. 28. It's what happens when you work out. You know? Well, do you have a beauty filter on? No. Oh. No, I have a Sony ZV-1. <laughs> oh, okay. So you work out a lot. Okay, that's and, good. And a diffuser on my ring light. So maybe that's that's what it is. But, maybe. And I, I do... I don't have a beauty routine, right? I'm not that kind of guy. But I do use Kiehl's, which has always been really oh, good. Oh, Kiehl's is good. Yeah. Um, but wait, so how did you get into love and stuff? Or do you want to not talk about that? So I was a police officer for eight years. Oh, and wow. a lot of the things that you see on the job are dysfunctional relationship patterns. And so you start looking at different things because you see things that were similar to maybe some past relationships that you've had. And it's like, okay, well, I've seen this dynamic before because I experienced it. And then you're on the job seeing all these different types of dynamics. No one is um, exempt from uh, poor relationship patterns and problems and, you know, all these things that happen. Yeah. But my job is to try and figure these things out and try to help these people navigate certain aspects of their life that they're not able to do. 
So I start diving into personal development work. You start with Tony Robbins, you know, and then you you go from Tony Robbins. Then all of a sudden you find Joe Dispenza. So you're doing spirituality yeah. stuff. And then you start listening to Jay Shetty. And then you get bored with that after a while. And you start you find Mel Robbins and Lewis Howes and, you know, pretty much anybody that's under the umbrella of personal development. And then you become a personal development junkie where you just keep absorbing all this stuff. And at some point you, you get to this place where you're like, I can't listen to this anymore. And then you grab a camera and you start making content. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because it's like you're just filled with all this information. Then you have all this life experience on top of that that, you know, is going to be beneficial for somebody. And so you just start building content. Um, for me, I ended up getting injured. I had bicep surgery. And here I am now. So amazing. That's a great yeah. story. I love I that. I don't, I don't know how great it is, but it's a story. Are you married? I'm not. Never married. No kids. I have a German shepherd named Chloe. Oh. Yeah. Nice. You know, nice. and so the the funny story with her name, I came to the conclusion and the resolution, right? Like you, you have to hit this point with inside yourself where you're like, okay, I'm probably never getting married. I'm probably never having kids. So Chloe was one of those names that I always liked for, for a child, oh, for a yeah. kid, right? So I'm like, you know, I'll just name my dog Chloe. And right. of course, I'm thinking of getting a second dog, a boy dog, and his name will be Jack. So wait, so what was uh, the boy name? So it would be Chloe and Jack. You should get a, another dog, Chloe I'm, and Jack. I'm thinking about it, but I'm also thinking of moving because Illinois just isn't doing it for me. So mm -hmm. I haven't I haven't decided what's going to happen yet with all that. Oh, someone said, let's circle back. Sorry, I'm reading it. No, you're fine. <laughs> if you, Jfit is married. Okay, so why aren't you married? <laughs> Did you not find the one? Did you find the one and you weren't ready and then it was oh. too late when you wanted her back? All right, let, let's do this. Do you believe in the one? I believe that we have 10 soulmates. So we have 10 the one. 10? Yes, 10. That's pretty, that's pretty specific, not seven or... No, because it's, so it's 10. I'm okay. Jewish and um, in Judaism, it says that you have 10. Okay. And each one is on a different level to where you are in life. So you'll meet that person at a certain stage. So it could be someone meets their soulmate at 20. They're not ready. They break up at 30. They meet another soulmate that was more fit for them at that age. So that's what I believe in. Um, and, so, and so what's great about that is, and it's very just true to life in general. And, you know, that's probably how I would answer your question is just the fact that I've been so many different people throughout my lifetime. Um, very early on, I was a chef. I did that for 15 years, um, was really good at that. And then the economy tanked in 2008 and I had to pivot. So I went back to school, went to college, got a bachelor's and master's, started a new career path, did all the things. Very different person from the time that I was a chef to the time that I went back to school, got my education to the time of starting my job as a police officer and getting my master's degree to then being the person I am today. And so as you continue to grow, develop and expand, um, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, you become a very different person yeah. by, the, by the time you hit my age. And so now I just think it's become a little more complicated. I've made it more complicated for myself because I can't stop. I can't stop myself. I'm that personal development junkie, right? I can't stop myself from, from doing those things. So I need somebody who's going to be on a similar path, the same track that is also in that process of growing and expanding in the same ways or similar ways that I am, or at least they're open to, to being able to do that or wanting to do that. That's where I'm at. And you haven't found anyone so far? Uh, not in Southern Illinois. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe that's why. I think, I do think that's why, um, you know, and then the other part of it is, and this people get a little, frustrated um when i say stuff like this but it's like i'm i don't have kids and i get that i'm 45 or close to it i get it people can pass judgment all you want i'm in a place in my life where i'm not ready to to be with somebody who has children um just because i've never had children and so i'm still in that part of my life where i can still do that do it successfully and have a family and get my chance that i've always wanted and that i worked for so that's kind of my perception of it and the way I feel about it. Are you on the apps? No. <laughs> All right. Before no. you laugh, hold on, hold on. Before you start laughing about Hinge and, ah. and honestly, Hinge is the only one um, that I think is good. Maybe there's other ones. I haven't seen any. You can meet. I know so many people that met 
through there. Also, now with technology, it's so hard to meet people in person because a lot of people are just home all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and you can do filters of preferences like age, religion, uh, political belief. So if I were you, I would get on it. I've been on it. And he here's what you end up finding. You find a lot of repeat offenders on these dating apps um, that use the dating apps as a means of getting their emotional needs met. And then they move on to the next conquest. Uh, this is true for both men and women. And I have no desire to be on the dating apps. Um, I agree with that, actually. Yeah. It, well, ex so especially when you start diving into attachment styles and you can very quickly recognize as you're going through somebody's profile, just the way that they write it and the words that they use and the way that they choose to express themselves. It's like, no, that person's avoidant. It's like you can just tell by the way that they're writing it unless ChatGPT is writing their uh, profile wow. for them, which which they should be using that if they're not like you're missing out. You should be using AI for that and maybe you'll get more dates. But um, yeah, I just have no desire to be on the dating apps. I get it. I get it. But maybe one day I'll change your mind. Maybe, but I prefer to meet organically. And that's, I think, the biggest challenge living in Southern Illinois is just there's not a lot of people that are in the same space that I am that still want that growth and expansion and, you know, looking to do new things and see life as an adventure. I see it very much as an adventure. I'm here to learn as much as I can and do as much as I can. And I want to meet amazing people along the way. And it'd be great to have somebody that is side by side and wants to do those same things or similar things or has their own thing and is really good at their own thing, but wants to come together and they can do that without being in some sort of competition with each other because it's not a competition. And I think that's where a lot of people fail in their relationships is they see their partner not as a threat, but definitely as a competitor in some yeah. way, shape, or form. Um, that actually brings up a topic for me that might okay. be a little controversial. Is that okay? You can do whatever you want. Okay. Um, I think a big reason why divorce rates are so high and why people are, are single for a long time. Facebook. Is, no. <laughs> Feminism. Okay? okay. Feminism. And I, I'm a career-oriented woman. Like, I'm very, you know, independent. And I think that I don't think men are greater than me, but I also don't think I'm greater than men. But a lot of the times women will post TikToks about how I need my man to make $500,000 or a million dollars. I need them to pay for my manicure, take me shopping, treat me like a queen. If, you know, to hire a chef, to hire a nanny to watch my kids, whatever, the whole nine yards. But what value are they providing? So it's like, you want these things, but what do you provide? Okay, fine. You don't, let's say you don't work because they're saying they don't want to work. Do you have dinner ready for your husband or boyfriend or partner when they come home? Do you support them in whatever they need? Are you there for them? Do you uh, go out of your way to be close to his family? Um, do you pack him lunch every day to go to work with? Do you clean the house? Do you, you know, do you take, go, do you go shopping for him? And I think there has to be a trade-off. The high value dater. What are your thoughts on someone who claims to be high value? And I say it with air quotes for people that are listening on audio right now, because we all have value and nobody gets to determine your worth. Yeah. Period. You get to do that, but you have to believe that you can do that first before you can establish what your worth actually is in a relationship. So I get very frustrated with that high value, low value stuff. And then you, you'll hear them say, well, it's preferences and it's all these other things that they're talking about. And it's like, it's fine that it's preferences, but you don't need to be condescending about it in the way that you're excluding um, a whole group of daters um, out of your field and making them feel less than. I just don't see the value in doing that. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, everyone has their own value to add. You know, um, I think you make up for like what other people lack. So like maybe someone I'm dating really wants to start going to the gym more. And let's say I go to the gym a lot. They'll probably like me because they'll feel like I'll add value to their life by taking them to the gym with me. That's like a small, dumb example. No, it's not dumb at all because we end up getting in relationships with people that are most like us, where, where we have commonalities and we can come together in that relationship. And the gym is a perfect example of that. If I come home and you're sitting on the couch and a million and one things haven't been done, 
and there's no reason for them to not have been done. And this is where, you know, people get a little upset. Just calm down. Like it's your house too. And you should be willing to clean and do things and, and partake in the roles inside the household to make sure that we're, we're efficient and we're getting things done and our life is, feels good. It feels good to our nervous system. It feels good visually inside the house. Like we should be helping each other out. And so when you have those differences between each other, those relationships often don't work out in the long term. And they're also the ones that started with potential. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. I hate do, you, when do you know oh, where yeah. I'm going with that? So people at a young age, they date potential. They think that this particular person 10 years from now is going to be this amazing person because of a story that they're creating in their head about this yes. person. But they have no evidence in the here and now that supports that they could ever become that person that they're creating in their head. So this person never really exists. And then they have no evidence in the past necessarily other than having been you know, a good athlete, maybe a decent student, but maybe they... Maybe they had a job while they were in school at the same time. So you can tell, ah, they're a hard worker, but you can't really gauge from that what's going to happen 10 years from now. So you do yourself a disservice when you're thinking so far into the future that all you see is that potential of that person. And then all the superficial things like check boxes and the preferences and, and all this other stuff. And so you get married at 21 to 25, 27, and you think that this is going to last forever. Some marriages do last forever, and that's an amazing thing. But more often than not, 10 years later, a couple kids later, um, they're miserable, they're unhappy. And the reason they're unhappy is because one of the people in the marriage didn't turn out to be the person that they were expected to be, except that expectation was never told to them. <laughs> so they, so it's true. Just, it's all in our heads, a lot of it, unfortunately. And I think a lot of it is fed by social media also. How so? Um, I think it feeds unrealistic standards. So you'll be on TikTok and you'll see a perfect couple and you'll see a husband cooking his wife dinner. And realistically, maybe that's the first dinner he's ever made for her in five years, but they posted it. And then you come home, you see your husband laying on the couch and dinner's not ready for you. You're going to end up hating your husband, even subconsciously. So it ends up building resentment and then it ends up breaking relationships. Yeah, it, it's... It turns into expectations. And some of these things I just don't think are unreasonable expectations. You use the dinner example. And I like that because, you know, again, if you're already home and you have time to make dinner, then why wouldn't you just make dinner? Why, again, why is it a competition? Because you're making it into a competition that, you know, you should be doing this yourself. You can come home and you can just do it. And it's like, well, but you've been here for an hour. You didn't really do anything. It's not like you did breath work, meditated, walked the dog, went for a run and did all this stuff in an hour. You were literally just chilling, watching whatever you were watching on TV and had an hour to put things together for us. Not for me, for us. Exactly. And, and that's the mindset that we're often missing. We're not, again, we're not thinking about it as we can build something amazing together and have it be this amazing thing, have a shared mission and vision for our relationship. Nobody talks about that, having a shared mission and vision, but actually laying yeah. out on a piece of paper, what does our life look like five years from now? What does it look like 10 years from now? How are we going to accomplish these goals? What is our shared mission and vision? Where are we going? How are we doing it? And why are we doing it? And do we both agree upon this? And then you go and you conquer it and you make it happen. But that's not the mindset. It's like, you're giving me something and you're getting stuff from the other person. And that's just, it, it's like this taking relationship on both sides and not, not a lot. No, of no giving. giving. Yeah, yeah. Not a lot of giving. I mean, I think that's why men, you'll see a lot of like older men or, or even young six men, if they're successful, they usually pick Barbie dolls to be in relationships with and to marry. And when I mean Barbie dolls, I mean those women who, are unrealistic, but beautiful. Maybe they had plastic surgery, very skinny, like a Barbie doll. They don't really speak. They don't really have their own opinions. Um, they don't work, but they're just there to serve their husband. And their husband would rather that than deal with a real woman because of the communication issues that are now in relationships. And for context, everybody, Chloe's in LA. So yes, I'm in LA, uh, Beverly Hills, actually. Um, so oh, yeah. oh. Well. I'm, Look, I don't look like a Barbie doll, um, and, and that's totally fine. I know I have a lot of friends who do look like Barbie dolls, but they don't got a lot going on. You know, they don't they don't got well, a lot going on and, up here. 
And so that's the whole thing. So we say these guys are choosing the Barbie doll. Why? They don't want to deal with the annoying parts that come with someone with a brain now. Yeah, uh, but isn't that equally as annoying? I think men, when they have a lot of money, they just want to be left alone, fed, you know, be in a romantic <laughs> relationship. I think, I think men in general, we just want to be left they alone. They just want to be alone, fed in a romantic relationship, and they want to show off a beautiful woman to gain points. That's it. That's all they want because men nowadays, they the chivalry is kind of dead. I'm going to be honest. It's very rare to find um, in the successful men. The broke men, they'll be so smooth. But <laughs> the successful men, okay, no so this, chivalry. Well, this brings up a good conversation. So those men who aren't as successful yet, and I say yet because a lot of them get involved in trades or in jobs that take time to accrue mm -hmm. status. Um, it can take a decade or more to, to be able to accrue that level of status. And so I, I do say don't date potential, but you also have to look for the evidence and the type of person that they are. Yes. And if they're showing up to work every day, they're performing their duties, they're doing exactly what they should be doing. They're, they're not hooked on drugs or alcohol. And, you know, you see them working their ass off to accomplish a lot of different things in their life. That is somebody you can build something amazing with. But all too often we look at who they are in the moment and it's like, well, you only make 50 grand. So why would I give you a chance? That's the biggest mistake women make. Um, they look at what man has now and they care about instant gratification and you have to think long term. So like I see this man, he's up at 6 a.m. every day. He's working 12 hour days. He's ambitious. He's smart. He's educated. He has goals. And I see him working towards them. There's no reason you should not be with him because if you're looking for your job as a woman is to motivate the man and push them and be there for them and help them become the best version of themselves in a, like in a business way. And so women nowadays, they just want to see that number. But if they don't see it, they run away and they don't realize what work is supposed to go into it. So you're a total supporter for traditional gender roles in relationships. Yes, but <laughs> the, I do, the caveat is I think men should help when it comes to cleaning and helping with the kids. OK, they don't need to do be full time, but I think they should help. Like, it shouldn't just be on the woman. You know, I think it should be 80-20 or maybe 70-30. I do think, though, that women should work, and I'll tell you why. Because what if one day the man wakes up and says, hmm, I don't like you anymore, which happens a lot of the times. Like, that's scary. I need my own financial backing. I need my own money. I need my own career. So I think, this is like the dream, the woman makes money. She keeps it for herself and maybe can spend it if they want to like go on a family vacation. She can help out or um, maybe get a new couch or something or wants to buy herself a handbag. But I think the man should provide the bills and the house and the groceries and the car. <laughs> so, yes, unfortunately. So, 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 e so everything, but the woman should have a backup plan in case that fails is exactly. what you're telling me. Exactly. Nice. A woman should have a backup plan because you never know. You never know. And then the woman's stuck with the kids. You think the man's going to take the kids and leave? No. The woman is stuck. Oh, boy. Do you so, have sisters? I do. How many? Yeah. I have one. Do you, are you have a mom in your life? I do. So do you understand where I'm coming from? I do. However, and that's really what this comes down to is advice you would give your little sister. And it's in selecting a good man. And what that actually looks like. And but a man can be good when you first marry them for the first 10 years. You don't know what's going to happen in 30 years. Potentially. But mm -hmm. it goes back to shared mission and vision. So if you enter into this relationship with the expectation that it's going to fail or potentially going to fail, then it'll fail eventually. That's just the self-fulfilling prophecy. But if you enter into the relationship with a shared mission and vision and you have this intent that we are going to build something together. We're going to build our family. We're going to build our family's empire. We're going to build this to last the rest of our lives. Then all of a sudden you're giving yourself purpose. 
not just as an individual, but as a couple. So now you have a shared purpose in this venture that you're moving into, which is life. And you've made this decision that, you know what, I'm not going to hang out on Instagram and talk to a bunch of people in my DMs. I'm not going to allow people into my life that shouldn't be in our life because we have a shared mission and vision. We've made this statement to each other and we plan on seeing this through together. You see uh, Alex Hermosi and Layla Hermosi, the way they've established their relationship, I think is really cool. Now, they came at it more from a business angle at first is what it seems, but you can tell that there is genuine love, respect, and they have a shared mission and vision. And that is the foundation that they built that relationship on. And now they're building an empire on top of it. And he'll even say in uh, interviews that, you know, he lay down his life for Layla. And he says that repeatedly. And I, I want to believe that to be true because it's so infrequent that you hear people talk about their relationship like that. Usually. Sorry. Southern. <laughs> it's a sneeze. Okay. Bless you. Usually you hear people talk about their relationships and then, you know, it slowly creeps out on Instagram and all these other places that, well, so-and-so is cheating or there was infidelity here or something happened when, when they were at this get together with somebody at a hotel room. And, you know, so there's a lot of things that can happen. And it's like so far, you know, knock on wood, that particular couple, they are who they say they are and they continue to show up like that. And so that gives me hope that, yes, you can find somebody to be in that type of relationship with and you can be in it and you can mean it 100 percent. But I'm pretty sure they both have their own money and then the group money as well. Yeah. So, um, certainly having, I think a job, absolutely. But you know, what's the limit on that? So the first several years of the child's life, do you, should you be in that 24 seven or should you be working during that time period? Or are we doing a side hustle, um, as a means of gaining income? Um, I think that it's not black and white. I think it's very great. I think it's a per situation kind of thing. So like when I, you know, one day, God willing, have a child, I have no idea what I'm going to do. I have to be in a situation to know. Yeah. I'm, but I'm also the type of person that I need like a purpose and a routine and a, and a goal and, and something that creatively, um, that like has a creative spark. But I don't know how I'm going to feel when I have a child. It could be that all of a sudden my goals will shift. And I think that, okay, this child, raising this child, that's my purpose not running a business. So I can't answer that. So are you looking to create a business from all this? Is that what you're doing? Oh, no, this is just for fun. I have a business. This is just for fun. <laughs> this is just for fun. I have, I have a... I this is just a cathartic. <laughs> no, this is like, okay, I have like 45 minutes. Let me sit down and record myself talking. But no, I have a med spa with my mom. And uh, nice. I run, so it's called Ox Synergy too free marketing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Free marketing. What, what do you guys do exactly? What do you we do? Hyperbaric oxygen therapy, IVs, red light therapy, infrared sauna and vitamin shots. Yeah. So it's fun. Cause like during my lunch, like I'll just come up here. I have a, I have an idea. I write it down. And then at the end of the day or in the middle of the day, I come up here so I'm in the same building. Mm -hmm. I record. Um, but I also take it like, usually if I go on a date, the next day is when I have the most content and the most ideas so if you see me posting a lot be like chloe what'd you do last night <laughs> so you, <laughs> you were didn't, on a date you didn't have a good date <laughs> yeah how was the date um but yeah and so are you meeting all these people on uh, all these people are you meeting these people on dating apps and in person a little bit of both do you just wait for them to come in for red light therapy and you're like that one no, I actually, um, I actually don't go on dates as often. I like took a break about a month ago. So now I'm kind of just like riding solo. But um, I did go on of a date. Now I've got that song in my head. Yeah, I'm riding solo. <laughs> yeah. But um, my friends tell me stories and I just go back based off like my previous experiences. And I feel like those are probably some of the best stories or the ones that you get from your friends. The best. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm excited to see where this journey goes. I think um, I think the biggest thing that women need to take away these days is that when a relationship doesn't work out, it has nothing to do with them. That's like the biggest. Well, so it's not just it's not just women. It's men and women, men and women. I'm and, not a, so I can't speak for men, I think. And it gets it, it's so wild to me 
that we take so much of this personally. And I was one of those people. You take it personally. It's a rejection. You know, somebody saying that they, they don't want to be with you. You don't never really get a reason. And there's certainly never any closure. Do you believe in closure? That I it used exists? to believe in closure. Yeah. And <laughs> no, I don't. From an anxious attachment standpoint, yeah, you, you want that closure. You need it and you, you seek it. You don't need it. closure for what? Well, like for what? Wh what are they going to tell you? They're not going to tell you the truth. That's for sure. Ah, right. They're going to tell you exactly what you want to hear. So exactly. where's the where's the benefit in that? There's all no they're all they're trying to do is get away from you, and so they'll yeah. say whatever they they have to say. Literally, that's all they want to do. Get away from you. They never want to see you again. And you need to just be like, okay, they're lost. They're an idiot. Not my fault that they're not smart. <laughs> and they're going to come back. Oh, they always come back. I learned that too. They always come back. How long does it take for them to come back? Six months, a year, maybe. Because that's always the one of the first questions people always ask is, well, I want to get my ex back, but you know, I'm in no contact. And you know, well, how long, how long does it take for them to come back? And it's like, well, it takes it long enough for them to be in another relationship or situation ship. And break that up not work out yeah. right it doesn't work and then they come back so however long that takes or if you can spend if you can actually do 30 days of no contact it's guaranteed not going to guarantee it because there there are no guarantees more often than not um they will contact you they'll send a text hey what's up but it's just a it's just to trick you right just to see that that door's still open it's not to actually walk back in that door it's just to say oh okay that's still an option for me yeah while they're trying to date other people so yeah um so when it comes do you believe in no contact is that a thing should we be doing no that? contact a hundred percent because men you know what they like to do and women too they like to plant seeds so it's like okay they have a little bit of seeds everywhere it's, whenever it's like they inception yeah and then they can water it it can grow a little but then they don't put too much attention it dies a little bit and then they go back they water they want to make sure there's always a backup plan like there's always that person that's going to be there for them if the other person doesn't work out nice. so men do that they keep you they keep you at arm's length you know so nobody can do anything <laughs> you, you we allow things to happen and it's on both sides Right. It's the same thing with the person that's, you know, the avoidant that says, well, can't we just be friends? And this is men and women. They want to keep you on the back burner. They'll maintain a, a limited friendship of whatever that looks like, of sending memes on Instagram or, um, you know, liking things on Facebook every now and again, just to let you know they're still alive and still, you know, still watching you. <laughs> But but that's it. And so you, you have to ask yourself, do you really want to be that backup plan? Do you want to have those connections? I'm a firm believer that I never used to be, but I'm a firm believer now when it's a, an ex is an ex for a reason. Let them stay an ex, because even if they try to come back, it's always going to be more of the same thing. And then even if they change, there's always going to be that element that gets bring, brought up later on when you have a problem or an issue. Oh, yeah. But remember that time you cheated? Remember that time you broke up with me and yeah. you know, all these other things happened? And it's like, OK, that was 10 years ago. <laughs> you know, are we still going to go through this? And so there's always going to be that hint of turmoil in the relationship that just also, doesn't have yeah. to be there. No. Also, one thing I recently really learned is that I had this issue where I would, for example, break up with a guy or, or a guy would break up with me and I'd be like, I'm never going to find someone that I like this much, or I'm never going to find someone that loves me that much, or I'm never going to find someone I'm attracted to this much. It's the biggest lie that you will ever tell yourself because you will. And I kept proving myself wrong over and over and over. I would say the same thing about every single guy. And then I ended up finding someone and that I felt, you know, that way for. So it was really eye opening. And I think people need to realize that. So are you on like number eight now or of your 10? Where are you at with all oh. of this? <laughs> my soulmates? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I definitely think my ex of two years was one of them. Well, you know, those people that impact us deeply are always going to be a part of who we are and like who we're becoming. So it's fine to think of them finally, fondly. They were a part of your life. Exactly. I think it's like loving a family member. It's kind of like very similar. 
at the same time, you still unfriend them and move on, or it's always going to linger. Yeah. But, but it, I don't but think you do you. Okay. <laughs> so many people hit me with the, yeah, but th there's no yeah, buts. When you allow someone to stay in the background, they're always going to be in the background. No, I didn't. I don't allow it. Like, I, yeah. like there's no contact. That's, that's good. It's done. Um, that's how I am. I've always been no contact because if there's contact, you can't break free and you can't move on. But are you still like liking photos or is this no contact, like no social media, no nothing? No, 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 nothing. No, nothing. That's I don't good. do that. Also, it wouldn't be fair for the next person I date. You know, I don't want the next person I date to be like still liking their ex's photos. That's where a lot of turmoil comes into modern relationships is people keep their exes in the background and then the new person at some point they're going to turn into a detective and they're going to start looking at things on like whatever social media and they're going to put two and two together that, oh, you used to date this person. And then and then they're going to start asking questions, trying to figure things out, and then they're going to see that they still like all your stuff. And then there's like light communication in the comment section like, what is this? Why yeah. are you doing this? And, you know, how do you think that makes somebody else feel? And so you're you're already putting your new relationship at a bit of a deficit because you're allowing that space for the other person in the background in your mind. Exactly. Exactly. You can't you can't let it be there, and even though it feels good in the moment. But like in the long run, it, it's just going to bite you in the ass. Well, what you're doing is chasing dopamine at that point. Yeah. Because we're all addicted to social media. I mean, it just it is what it is. That's why we're here. So was it really an $18 yogurt parfait? I swear. I don't lie. Like I, I know everything in California is extremely expensive. But $18. $18. It wasn't even like a gold flaked parfait. It was like a little jar with yogurt and granola and some berries. $18. So do you get gold flaked? yogurt parfaits no i don't no. but like that no. would explain why it's 18 dollars. why it's 18 no i go to this place i'm not going to say the place because i don't want people to follow steal. you yeah. i don't want people to steal it no people can nobody's following me let me tell you that i promise you it's the best iced coffee in la it's so underrated but it's very expensive and that's where the 18 dollar cap um 18 dollar yogurt is well that's crazy town should we read the comments before sure to go soon yeah yeah i did have another question <laughs> oh, okay so you you keep using food food references and all your stuff oh yeah so we've got cilantro and soap peaches tomatoes mushrooms and then do karen sarah and joe even exist are these actual people okay. so karen sarah and joe are just names i made up because they're okay. popular names but it's like when you're saying joe when i'm saying joe, it could mean jake the your ex or it could mean um adam that guy you went on a date with two weeks ago like it could mean anyone but i'm just using generic names right on. and then as for food i just love food i'm like a foodie so i just use food as an analogy and people seem to relate to it so it's smart. Uh, again, well, it's through, what draws people in. So when I went through my first breakup at 18 years old, which was the hardest, I thought I was going to die. Like I literally sat there at 7 a.m. with a gallon of water, like trying not to pass out because I was crying so much. <laughs> and the quote that that really, really made an impact on me was, "You could be the juiciest, ripest peaches and peach in the world, but if." Oh, yeah. You could be the juiciest, ripest peach in the world, but there's always going to be someone who doesn't like peaches. So that quote got me through it. Um, but yeah, it was a really rough breakup. After that, I kind of like, I recover well after breakups. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. W what's a delusion ship? Um, a, delu <laughs> a delusional ship. A, a delusional relationship. So it's like a situation ship where you're convinced the guy is in love with you and that's why he's not labeling the relationship. That's called a delusional relationship. You're being delusional because that's not true. He's not in love with you. That's horrible. If he was in love with you, he'd make you his girlfriend. So that's... a lot of people are in delusional relationships. Yeah. That sounds awful. I, I, I don't want that. No, 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 you don't. I, 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 had, I had my own delusions at some point. I was like, oh, my God, he's not texting me because he's overthinking every single text that he's sending me because he doesn't want to sound like a loser. And that's why he's not texting me. 
But really, it's because he just didn't want to talk to me. So it's me being delusional. You know? Yeah. When you have an anxious attachment style, that that happens. You start making excuses for exactly. inconsistent behavior. Yeah. And, and all of those inconsistencies, instead of acknowledging them for what they actually are, you know, we have to deny it because that doesn't feel good to our nervous system. So we tend to dismiss things. But in that process, then you're betraying a piece of yourself in, in going through that. So, yeah, exactly. Which is horrible. So Tina P, my podcast is called Chloe Talk. C-L-O-E-T-A-L-K. Chloe Talk. Um, I just have to use this account because the other one doesn't have enough followers to go live. See, let me go all the way up to when I first joined. And what was the coconut thing? Coconut milk bob. You need to follow. I blocked her so I, I wouldn't become crazy. <laughs> coconut milk bob. Someone said, what drove you to cheat on your partner for the first time? And do you still carry guilt? I've never cheated. Oh, here I got something. Someone said, my ex broke up with me because he needed to be alone to work on his mental health. Then started getting to know the woman that was a problem in our relationship. So I have something to say about that. Because first off, sometimes men do need to get away from a relationship to work on their mental health. It's not being delusional by believing them. But if they are getting to know someone else and like dating someone right after you, then that means that like, let's say you were perfect 90% of the time, but 10% of the time you weren't perfect. They're going to go and find someone that has that 10% that you were lacking that has that. And then they're going to date that person and then realize, wait, the 90%, like the rest of them sucks and then go mm -hmm. back to you. It's the truest, the most true thing in the entire world. You see people getting out of relationships. They find someone right away. Mm -hmm. It's because, and I've experienced this, because they're focusing on the 10% that the other person didn't have. So they find someone with that. But then they're in the relationship. They realize, oh my God, I hate everything else. I miss the other person. Um, I should be able to deal with the 10% they didn't have. It's because they're love avoidant. They're avoiding love. They're, so in attachment styles... What ends up happening is the anxious attacher chases away the avoidant. The avoidant pulls away to create distance because they feel overwhelmed in that scenario. Their nervous system is, is on fire at this point. And so they do need to pull away to, in order to relax because the anxious person is constantly trying to get their needs met by the avoidant. The avoidant can't do that. And so what ends up happening is occasionally that same avoidant will start dating somebody else because they have people in their DMs that they're still talking to. And that new person is easygoing because there's no expectation on that person. Yeah. And so they can just be free flowing and do whatever they want to do because that other person hasn't put expectations on them. But then that person starts putting expectations on the avoidant and then they go back to the other person because now their nervous system has calmed down Um from the previous person so they just go back to that and then they bounce around oh my god and they go stuff. back and it, they can if you if so you allow sense. it which is why i tell people you know you have to know your goals values and standards for a relationship with you and then you have to stick to it and stick to your boundaries on all of that and hold people accountable so when you hold the avoidant accountable when they start doing that kind of stuff then they start to learn you're, you're teaching them how to treat you that you're not going to tolerate that type of behavior wow that's I didn't know that. You just kind of opened my eyes. Thank you. Thank you. That actually answers someone's question. Is well, when my partner ran away twice from committing to me. I mean, again, it's all nuanced. It's relationships. It can be a lot of different things. Um, but if you don't follow my Instagram, you should go check it out because I do a lot of memes. And my memes are all about relationships and attachment styles. And it's got the best comment section. So, okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. <laughs> follow it i saw I, I saw it now i'm gonna dm me i'm gonna follow yeah. we have someone who said i was in a relationship for five years and he ghosted me and won't say why or talk to me five years oh my god poor guy that's a long time it's the ghosting part that that's hurts like immature but you know what it is the guy who ghosted or the girl who ghosted him uh which is is a coward i think scared of you know they're scared they're just scared of looking dumb and showing themselves 
and they are embarrassed of their actions and thoughts. Well, so that could be one thing. Or they broke up with you a long time before that, healed from the late relationship while they were in the relationship, and then decided to let you know that they broke up with you and just moved on. But they had already healed from the relationship. And I think that's one of the hardest things that you can possibly go through. Yeah, but this, yeah, I mean, I think it's the context because this comment seems like they were in a relationship for five years and all of a sudden just ghosted. Yeah, it's not all of a sudden though, right? If they, if, for that person, there, there would have been signs and signals, distance created, things that, you know, because we get complacent. We're together with somebody for five years, things kind of happen. And day by day becomes, you know, a little bit more of the same. And if you're not careful, you turn into like this brother sister relationship yeah. where, you're, where you're just kind of living together side by side and you're doing things and, and you see each other, but you're not actually seeing each other. And so that other person, they disconnect, you know, and there's going to be things that aren't happening in the relationship that should be happening if you're in love with somebody. And so they're just disconnected and had been for a while. And then they just up and leave or or they ghost or they tell you i'm i'm done it sucks yeah it does people are brutal unfortunately Great. but this is why i encourage you guys read all the books behind me because they're gonna help you mm -hmm. can you send me some books of course send me some links amazon links only yeah. amazon. <laughs> it's the fastest i'm addicted to amazon you can so you go to my stand store and just hit my Amazon link. And oh, perfect! It, it'll have all the books I've read. I, I really went through it a few years ago. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> and, and so you just read a lot and you figure things. You out. know who I love? I don't know if hmm. you follow her, Najwa, mm -mm. N A J A N A J W M A. Oh no, N A J W A, Najwa. She writes a book called Mind Platter. You should follow her. It's amazing. She got me through so much in my life. I just looked it up. I'll look at that later. What's one thing that you learned from her that you can think of off the cuff? To focus on yourself. And the only person who's there for you at the end of the day is yourself. So to always be, to love yourself, I think is the biggest thing, biggest takeaway. How can we love ourselves? Well, one is knowing that brighter days are always ahead. So it's like you think the world is dying, the world is ending and your life is over, but everything changes. So like the happy times will end up being sad. The sad times will end up being happy. So we're in a constant up and down in our lives. And that I think really helps you get out of like any rut. Um, the, the sweet is not as sweet without the bitter. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So and self-love and, and knowing that brighter days are ahead is, is like what she focuses on. And that really re resonated with me. I like that. Yeah. Okay. I have to go. Okay. I'm going somewhere. I'm not going to say where. On a, on a date? <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to be ready in 15 minutes and I'm in a hoodie and sweatpants. So. Well, good luck. Thank I'll be I'll be looking forward to content tomorrow. Oh, yeah. I'm going to have some content. <laughs>